it's trying not to to kind of sink into being being a particular type of cuisine um, and I think that's really reflective of my cooking and my team's cooking around me is you know we're not gonna we're influenced from from basically everywhere um, and I think that's I like to believe that's the way cooking should be going unless you've got something to say because that's important and culturally significant to you then we've got to be open to using you know what's around us and, and the information is there. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The hospitality sector is filled with opportunities to take your career to the next level. You never know how they might emerge or when. But how do you take advantage of big opportunities and make them your own? Luke Hayden is the executive chef of Society and Lillian Brasserie in Melbourne. Luke, how are you going? Yeah, very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. It's good to get you on the show. You've got uh, quite a big role. It's two um, big uh, operations. Uh, what's things like at the moment? Uh, yeah, really busy, um, as, as I'm, you can imagine. Um, two sizable restaurants, um, also with with a really strong events program. So, yeah, I mean, life's busy, but it's really good. It's, uh, you know, really enjoying the role and really enjoying the, the challenge of uh, – you know, modern day hospitality and what that looks like, and obviously trying to try to set the bar and the standard for for what you know large scale restaurants uh, are and need to be going forward. You've uh, had some pretty big roles uh, in your past, which we can delve into um, shortly, and and the history of society is well documented in the press. But what was it like for you um, making that shift to take on the big role? Um, it was really exciting, to be honest. I mean, I'd, I'd returned to Australia. Uh, it was the start of 2018 and kind of really looking for something. I, I didn't know it was this particular role at the time, but, you know, when when things come your way, you just kind of got to say, okay, what's the best for me at this time in my life? And overall, it was it was really exciting to, to be offered and, and also to have people have that faith in you to be like, you know, we've got this – you know, groundbreaking restaurant, whichever way you look at it, you know, whether it's the size, whether it's what we're trying to do, whether it's, you know, the direction we're taking it. Um, and, you know, they, you know, especially, you know, you look at Chris has given me the opportunity to take that forward. So personally, it was, it was an enormous challenge in that space to be like, okay, you know, you have, you have your moments where you're like, you know, is this, am I, am I up for this? Is this everything I need to be? But it's also a great opportunity. I, I found it a great opportunity for growth. It kind of took me out of that, 35, 40 seat traditional fine dining restaurant. It really encouraged me and, and f- I guess in many ways forced me to look at things differently and, and question the way I managed and the way I approached food and hospitality. And I've really enjoyed that. And I think that's been really pos- a really positive result of my career in, in, have, in doing that. And uh, kind of, I think we're seeing the benefits of that now and especially personally, really seeing the, the growth levels there we're, we're 12 months in. Do you have any examples of the how you've had to approach things differently because of the scale? Um, yeah, I mean, as as kind of with anything with society, we 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 want to do it at the highest level we we can. I mean, it's not we're not saying we're a particular type of restaurant. I think that's where it becomes difficult. We're not saying we're a fine dining restaurant. We're not saying we're you know a casual dining, but we want the standards and we want to set the operation up, or we have to be you know of the level where. We can have people come in, whether they be young Australians or international chefs, and be able to experience world-class kitchens and, and cook world-class food. So the challenge there, or not the challenge, but so much the, the exciting part of that is is to be able to look at my knowledge and what I've done in the past and perhaps what I may have done on a smaller scale and be like, okay, I want to, this is what we what we want to be doing. And this is the way we want to be running kitchen kitchens, but how do we do that three, four times the size? And it's been, you know, it's really encouraging to be able to do that. And uh, and we've had some really great results. Give us a sense of the scale um, of the um, the kitchen and the staff and the, so the sort of day-to-day runnings of it. Um, so, yeah, society being a 100-seat restaurant, literally in the same, um, obviously, we we we're busy, so we're, we're lucky. We're in a fortunate position to to be busy. So day to day, you know, we're, we're looking looking upwards of of thirty forty chefs coming through the place, uh, different shifts. Um, 
so yeah, there's a lot to a lot to be across. But um, I'm really fortunate that we've been able to establish a really strong management team uh, around and with me, and obviously the support of a larger group, which is really fantastic. Um, you know, it's my first time working in a, in a larger group, which is I've actually found really enjoyable, and I think it's really great to have that support network around you, especially in a in a role where you know we are trying to break ground on being able to do really high successful end dining um, on a scale that is accessible to people. I want to explore the food that you're doing at both restaurants shortly, but take us back to when you were young. What sort of role did food play in your family? Yeah, I'm from, uh, I don't admit it to many people, but uh, the first first probably 10, uh, 11, 12 years of my life, I, I'm from a small country town in New South Wales. It was, it was very rural, very agricultural, and uh, – we we was a long line of far, a big farming family basically, so when I was trying to think about food and the history of you know what what in, what kind of dragged me into it, it probably took me a long time to understand what that was. You know, I always kind of credited okay, I used to pick up cookbooks in my teenage years and things like that. But I actually I think now it's probably a little bit more to do with well, there's always conversations around food and around produce and around seasons and around you know what's growing, what we have available, um, live off the land sort of style stuff. So I think that probably did set me up for whether it was going to be in food directly or around food or in production or farming, whatever it may be. I think that's kind of, it's a little bit in the DNA, so to speak. Um, So yeah, I think it's probably taken me up until maybe a couple of years ago to really realize that the impact that had on my life. Um, And then to kind of Layer on top of that, um, we moved up to up the north coast of New South Wales when I was early teenage years and um, hanging around Byron Bay and the cafes and it was a pretty cool place to be. So, um, yeah, that kind of started the journey there. Do you have any stories of um, feasts or dishes or the sort of food that you would eat as a family as a kid? Yeah, we, we used to – it's always been a good sense of occasion, um, which I think is something that I've carried on as well. Um, so, you know, things like – classic roast chicken or a really good spaghetti bolognese you know my mum was kind of really big on that sense of occasion you know we'd said I'd, I'd pleaded to set set the nice table up you know with all the all the you know special special layout and, and then tablecloths and all that sort of jazz and even you know it might just be a Wednesday night but you know if there's a you're having a roast chicken or something like that but early days was probably it was a lot of stuff that we had we were producing so it was a lot of lamb we went you know a lot of lamb and you know there'd be You'd kill a kill a cow, and then there'd be beef for the next six months and things like that. But, um, but yeah, it was it was in many ways not a complex. It wasn't anything you know that was overly historic or, or culturally relevant. It was very much just the coming together of you know the family sitting at the table, which I think I really latched onto, and I think it's helped, helped me a lot in my career. To as I said, I'm a sucker for that sense of occasion and making people feel feel special around a table and I'm fortunate to to have come from that background you know we ate dinner together every night which is you know a real you look in hindsight now I think now I'm a bit older that's a real blessing to have um but yeah it's kind of talking about technique and and anything that's you know really unique it wasn't wasn't necessarily about that it was more just about the sharing the times together what were the first uh, experiences that you had in the industry first experiences in the industry um so I'm I'm one of those strange people that um, I've never really thought about doing anything else. Strangely enough, I've never kind of explored other options of oh maybe I'll I'll go and do this or maybe I'll go and do that. Apart from obviously really young, you want to be your dad, so I wanted to be a farmer for a while. But um, beyond beyond that, I kind of started washing dishes at some like as a local event center uh, that did weddings. I used to help out there on weekends, um, and then. Kind of delved in through through work experience with school. I used to do two three weeks at a time. Uh, I spent some time up at Ray's at Watergo's for a little while, and a few, and again another couple of places through Ballina. Um, and then probably when I was about, I think it would have been seven, 16, 17, I, I kind of took a, a semi permanent uh, like after school role. Um, probably a bit off more than I could chew to be honest, but that was at a, a place called the Blue Room, which is. Unfortunately, no longer there in Ballina, but it was one of those classic cases of, you know, quite decent cooking and quite a decent chef kind of stuck in a motel town. Um, but, yeah, it was it was really 
looking back at it now, like it, it was a it was a pretty tough environment for a teenage kid, but at the same time, it sets you up, and it, you know, it, it, you learn the ways. Like, okay, is is this what I want to do? Because if it is, this is kind of how it's going to be. Not saying that you can't evolve and change, but I think it's great to have that insight at an early age. Personally, you moved to Melbourne for a couple of years at a, at a young age. How different was that to what you were used to? Uh, yeah, very different. I mean, I, I finished up my apprenticeship in Byron. Uh, when, yeah, I was literally not maybe just 19. Um, so yeah. And then I, I kind of felt, and, and whether this was arrogance or, or the right thing, I'm not too sure, but I kind of felt that I'd outgrown the area a little bit at the time. Um, obviously you look up around that area now and there's several great restaurants and there's plenty of learning opportunities for young chefs. But I did feel at the time that Melbourne or, or a city, um, was was the place to go, and and I'd always always really liked Melbourne. I always thought it was, I always felt more comfortable here um, than perhaps Sydney or, or Brisbane was only you know an hour and a half away. But I'd always felt really comfortable in Melbourne. So it was quite literally just a, a pack the car and I'm going to Melbourne idea. Um, so to get down here, get set up, um, it, it was it was a real challenge. I think in many ways. I was hunting a lifestyle rather than a career at the time, being that probably a little bit immature um, and, yeah, just kind of coming down and, and really being like, oh, I want to go and live in Melbourne and, you know, go to clubs and, and do all that sort of stupid stuff you do at that age. But it, it did, you know, I was fortunate enough when it, when getting here to to be able to work in a couple of places that were really beneficial to me, um, in particular uh, Cheshire in the Tekka. Um, which at the time was, you know, quite a quite a good solid Italian uh, Italian restaurant, which again had a had a good bones of a kitchen um, that you know had some real real guys in there that knew what they were doing or had been doing it for a really long time. So I was fortunate to do that because I mean I, I think it's very easy to bounce around and and kind of not really find your niche. Um, so that was uh, that was a, you know a challenge coming into like an inner city busy um, kind of hatted restaurant. Um, but at the same time, I kind of loved it. It really, really suited me. Like I've always felt really comfortable in kitchens and, and especially fast, busy kitchens. It's something that I've always really, um, and being in a city, it, it kind of, I really started to thrive. I felt, felt the hustle and bustle really suited me. The UK is a rite of passage for so many chefs, or at least it was considered to be, and you carved out the majority of your career over there. Um, Tell us about the decision to go over there and, and what it was like. Yeah, so the decision to go over there, I think it, it was a similar one to leaving leaving Byron was, you know, I kind of, I, look, there was plenty more I could have done in Melbourne and, and there's been people, you know, who I worked with back then that have carved out great careers here. I, I just felt at the time it was a bit of an itch to travel as well. It was, you know, I'd been, been working like fairly solidly and quite hard for, for a good couple or a few years and I kind of, Figured I'm, I'm very fortunate to hold, you know, a ancestry. I can get an ancestry visa through my grandparent, Northern Irish grandparents. So it wasn't as complex for me as perhaps other people, which was really great. And I thought I'd really take that opportunity to be like, right, if I can go and live in another country and I'm not concerned about, you know, whether I've got 12 months, two years, I can literally make it what I want it to be. Um, so it really, it probably started more out of, out of a travel itch rather than a, a desire career like and I and I say started because that's that's what it was and then once I got over there I think and I and kind of coincided with being you know 20 21 it really kind of did start to turn in my head being like oh hang on if I if I really want to I worked in a couple of places you know pizza place and I went to France for six months and did a season up in the Alps and all great times and great memories but I kind of started to realize that there's two ways you can go in this industry, uh, or in my view anyway, that you can you can either stick your head down and, and do the yards and, and get really great training and start to understand how restaurants work and, and what the standards are to succeed, or you can mill around. You know, you can, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just what you want out of your career. So um, I kind of spent a lot of time staring at a mountain when I was in France, and uh, from that point I, I set myself – uh, some goals and some challenges and the first being that whatever whatever I did for the next 10 years you know whatever restaurant I went to was going to be a step up or or a you know 
an improvement on the last, um, and whether that be whether that be a positional thing, a accolade thing, a you know uh, whatever it is, I just felt the need to be like I just I I can't go backwards. It was just a I don't know how to describe it, but it was just an underlying thing that I can't can't go backwards. And whether that was healthy or not, I, I mean I can't tell you that. But so um, you know from that point I. I managed to get a job in a, in a like a one Michelin star gastro pub up in the north of England, up in uh, just near York, which um, was a bit of a cultural shock. I'm not going to lie. Uh, this you know this kid, young kid from Australia heading up to uh, the depths of the north of England. Um, but again, that was a really enjoyable time, and, and it was another stepping stone in kind of realizing, okay, this is what it takes to to hold these positions. You know, they're earned. They're not given. Um, you know, you don't you don't become successful restaurants or you know accoladed restaurants or busy restaurants. More importantly, without the work that goes into it and the people you have and the structures you have in place. So, I was lucky to to get that position, and then from there it kind of set me up to you know once once you can get a couple of things under your belt and a bit of experience, um, it really does start to roll um, if you want it to. Um, so yeah, and from that point, I kind of. Um, kind of headed down to London and, and started with Marcus Waring's. Do you have any stories of what it was like in his kitchen? <laughs> Plenty, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how far we should get. No, uh, look, you know, Marcus's kitchen, you know, is a very tough kitchen. There's no getting away from that. Um, but in saying that, I, I do credit that for setting me up, you know, in my career, for, uh, you know, in, in a cooking sense. Um, I, I learned probably more in 14 months there than I did, you know, the eight, nine years previous to that. Um, just because, you know, you, some of it's, you know, you're you facing the, in the, in the, in the coals, you know, so you've got to, you've got to either sink or swim. But at the same time that I was, I was buzzing off that, that kind of big London restaurant, that feel about it, that energy that you read about, you know, you read Boiling Point or, uh, sorry, not boiling point. You read Ramsey, you know, biography, humble pie, or something like that, and you, you feel that, or you read Marco's stuff, and it, it just had that feel about it, that real energy of we're all here with a common goal, and whatever it takes is what we're going to do. Um, you know, you forget, forget sleep, forget you know, family life, forget any of that. It's all, it's all for this common goal, is which is to serve great food, um, and what what comes with that. So, you know. It, it was extremely tough. I mean, you know, you never – I'll be honest, I think the whole time I was there, I don't think I ever felt completely set on a section. Um, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, you know, what what you're able to achieve in that and, and the cook that I left there as um, was you know, far superior to what I came um, – albeit, you know, you have to duck out of the way of a few things or you have to, <laughs> you know – remake a few things and you're not quite sure what exactly is wrong with it but you know at the same time you know I look back I'm able to look back now you know with a lot of kind of you know a lot of happiness around that time perhaps it's not happiness you know in the moment or you know there were a lot of challenges and there were a lot of sleepless nights but I'm able to look back now and, and you know openly say that it is situations like that albeit the industry has changed and that's a that's a good thing and I, and I believe that that place has changed with it. Um, but for me at the time, that's what I needed. I'm not saying everyone had to go and do it, but it's, it is really much, it's what I kind of needed at that point in my career and albeit a bit of a kick up the backside, but sometimes, you know, it, you've got to realize as well what, what drives you and what you react to and what you kind of really want to do. You mentioned that you're on a mission to take things to the next level or learn or um, continually kind of evolve and every decision would be based on that. What, what were the next things that you did from Marcus Waring to um, fulfill that kind of direction you're going? Yeah, so once, uh, you know, I was before I actually, sorry to rewind slightly, but before I went to Marcus's, I, I did a uh, did a, a, a month stage or, or placement at, at the Fat Duck. Um, which, you know, seems crazy now in 2022 to say that you did that. But at the time, that was that's what you did. You know, you wanted to get access to those restaurants. That's just literally, that was your part and, that was part and parcel. Um, so I was fortunate to do that and, and I, I really enjoyed the place. I, I, I enjoyed what they did and, and 
it wasn't so much the attraction of, oh, you know, Heston's a mad scientist and look at these crazy things we're cooking here. It was a, an attraction to the consistency, the, the, the drive to simulate, or oh, sorry, not simulate, but the drive to make everything exactly the same and exactly how it needs to be every day for the same amount of covers, for the same amount of portions, to the exact same weight, all that sort of stuff. I, I thought it was, you know, I'd, I'd never seen anything like that. And, and just the control around, you know, what you're doing. So off the back of that, I, I really, to be completely honest, I wanted to stay after the month. I'm like, you know, I, I spoke to Johnny, the head chef at the time. I was like, you know, look, is there, is there any way, is there anything, you know, and he's like, look, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to get a job here. I don't have anything available. Uh, etc. So, off the back of that, yeah. After you know, I'd been at Marcus's just over a year, and and I actually got an email from Johnny and said, you know, something's come up, um, which I, I was completely out of the blue. I hadn't spoken to him in literally twelve months, and um, so yeah, literally said, you want to come back and spend a day with us and and see if you still want to come on board. So I saw that as an opportunity that to to really kind of sink my teeth in. Then I set myself kind of a two year two-year period that I'd really like to stay at the Fat Duck because, as I said, I didn't just every year at Marcus's. I felt if this opportunity hadn't come up, I would have stayed on. It wasn't like I was looking to leave, but I felt, as you said, that, that drive to be like, okay, here's an opportunity has been put in front of me to spend a, a large amount of time and really understand a world-class rest, well, a, you know, well-known and world-class restaurant that is operating – especially at the time, far beyond most or 99% of other restaurants and not just not just what food they're producing because, you know, that's up to debate, of course, but what I felt at the time was the way they were operating, um, you know, the way they were looking after their staff, the way, you know, we were having – you look at staff meals, there's two staff meals a day, we're on four-day rosters, things like that. And it wasn't about working less, but for me it was just like this, this is a new way of looking at things. This is a complete new way of it's not just – put your foot to the floor and go a million miles an hour and hope you come out the other side of the tunnel. It was very much, you know, how can we get the best out of everyone and how can we control every step of the process in what we're putting on a plate, the way we're serving it, where the waiter's standing when they're doing it, the way the light's sitting above the table. That was fascinating to me. It was literally like, it felt like Alice in Wonderland, literally. Like it was very, very interesting. So I felt, I felt like that was a bit a good step for me at that particular time. I, I kind of had had great exposure to raw cooking and and you know understanding kitchens and hustling and, and being able to, and great cooking technique. And now it was about really being able to do that consistently over a long period of time. So that's where and you know I, I, as I said, I went to stay for two years and actually ended up there for well three and a half, nearly four years in the end. Um, which is a you know a sizable time for a restaurant you know we could say these days but but in general um, you don't you don't hear a lot a lot of people staying long periods of time there but that was you know I felt I felt like I was consistently evolving in that space like it's very easy to look at as oh well, you know the menu doesn't change that much and you know how could you how could you just do the same thing for that period of time but I didn't feel like that in that space I felt like we we're always going through changes I was evolving as a person I was in my mid to late twenties and I was discovering what what I liked, what I was interested in, what the attractions were for me to cooking. And it wasn't just about, you know, I was able to follow the leader in, in my day to day, but then I was able to open my mind to be, you know, as you are encouraging anything in that world to, you know, you've got to question everything, you've got to look at everything, you've got to have everything around you. And then I was fortunate, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I was, I was going to move on a, a touch before that. And then we had some conversations with bringing, bringing the restaurant to Australia um, for the, for the pop-up and, and Johnny, Johnny was a, as I said, the head chef at the time said, you know, you might want to, might want to stick around for this one. Um, Cause it might suit you quite well. Um, you know, to be able to, to take the restaurant you've been working at back to Australia and be part of that. And, I'm very thankful for that because that was that was an incredible opportunity um, to be able to bring the scale of the fat duck to Australia to the you know lack of a better word the hysteria that was around it at the time um, you know that was that was really great and then from that point I really 
I really felt that I'd reached the point now where I, I needed I needed to look at some management experience. I needed to look at okay, I can cook the food, but I can't. I have I've never never run kitchens. I've never kind of managed teams. So that was my next step. That's what I kind of set myself a goal, and it's like okay, you know, I'm working in a three Michelin star restaurant. I'm you know running sections. I'm contributing at a junior management level, but the goal has got to be to be able to actually translate this into being able to start to run kitchens or create dishes or, or, you know, effectively be a sous chef or a head chef. So that was, that was my goal. And and I felt London was still the best place for me to do that. Um, So I headed back over and I kind of pinpointed kind of that one Michelin star British cuisine idea, you know, then for people that are familiar with London, there, there is, there's plenty of them and there's some really great ones and there's some not so great ones. But um, I kind of pinpointed four, three or four restaurants. You know, I was talking to Isaac at, at Clove Club and, 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 and Tom at Story and a couple of other guys. And I just felt, I did, you know, I did a trial at Restaurant Story and I just really felt at home. From the moment I walked in the door, it, it felt like home. Um, and which is it's strange for restaurants because, you know, we spend a lot of time in our restaurants, you know, being on edge or, or being ready to go or being up and about. But I, I just felt really comfortable from the moment I walked in. So I took a took a sous chef job uh, there. So um, basically that was part of the progression to go, you know, okay, I've worked in a brigades of these, you know, great restaurants and, and learned a lot and, and I've been able to translate that into a senior position in what at the time, you know, felt like and probably was a really up-and-coming restaurant we were trying to look at things a little bit different uh we were trying to you know blow away the cobwebs of of what was you know a bit stuffy or a bit over the top and and in many ways was that new new british cuisine that was heavily relying on nordic um and it, it, yeah it was great it felt like we were really on something it felt like we we're really kind of buzzing around kind of trying to go in every day small team and uh, and just produce what at times was far too long of a tasting menu in hindsight. But um, just really kind of push ourselves to be like, okay, why can't we do that? You know, we may only be a 40-seat restaurant, but why can't we, you know, have this on the menu? Or if we want to do pom souffles, but, you know, it's going to take us two hours, but we're going to get it done. Um, so that's – and uh, basically from that point, I was sous chef for a little while and then was fortunate to get promoted to the head chef position, um, which which was great, which I which I stuck around for a while. And, and you know, I'm really proud of that part of – or I'm proud of my whole career. I'm really proud of that part to be able to, you know, to run a, run a Michelin star restaurant in the capital, you know, of the UK. I mean, I still think London's one of the most amazing cities in the world and, and just to be part of that on a daily basis and – and to build relationships across the industry at that level uh, it was a really exciting time. Uh, it was really great. Do you have any stories of what it was like at, at that age uh, in that head chef role in London? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely. I think uh, it there's it's a funny thing to look at when in we don't you know you look at other industries and there's you know a lot of structure around progression and you know you're going to do this course and then you you can be at this role whereas in in hospitality there's 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 not a lot around that you know if we really look at it there's not you know if you're chef to party you want to be a sous chef you don't really complete a course and become a become a sous chef um but i think there was so much learning in that for me i, I mean i'll be honest i i approached being a sous chef and then a, probably early days of a head chef as I had been trained, um, which was probably a very over the top, um, full of micromanaging, you know, I'd walk in on, on a daily basis and basically rewrite the menu and tell everyone what they're doing wrong and then basically end up doing it for them anyway. Um, which, you know, is part of a learning curve and I look back now and there's, there's moments like that I cringe a little bit. I'm just like, you know, that's that's just a classic case of immaturity and an inability within myself to be able to communicate what I needed from people, um, which, you know, you've all got to go through a process. You can't expect to be perfect straight away. But, you know, I think 
looking at story for for what it was and and it really was that introduction into you know you're responsible for this i was fortunate to have a great relationship with tom tom sellers who who owns the restaurant and he was very very trusting and comfortable of me to to you know take care of the day to day um so yeah i mean there was some really really great defining moments for me you know we'd serve serve full full weeks and full rooms and and have no hiccups and then you'd have other days other weeks where you'd have people go for staff meal and never come back and you'd go back and you'd start the day with that start the day with eight people and you'd finish the day with five or six and you've got you you know you you see them running down past Sainsbury somewhere on the way out the door but uh and you know a lot of that was was London culture at the time and I think you know, kind of that that mindset of kind of next batter up needs to or has has had to change, which is great. Um, but at the time, it was such an investment in what we were doing and what was in front of us, and the and the vision and the food we're trying to produce. That you know, it it did come down to okay, we just need to keep going. We need to have the common goal of producing you know this amazing product for the people coming in the door. Tell us about coming back to Australia and um, and what that landing back was like. Yeah, it was it was an interesting one. Um, I, 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 I we made the me and my partner we made the decision to to come back to Australia. It was it was it was based off you know I'd pretty I'd reached thirty, got to the point, and, and I made the decision I didn't didn't want to have a restaurant in the UK. It wasn't wasn't really where I wanted to be. I had a, a big pull to come home. Um, and that wasn't really a professional pool. That was more, I just, I'd been there a long time, been living in chair houses, been, you know, working my ass off, so to speak. And I kind of, you know, we just felt that it was a good opportunity to, to take that time and be like, okay, let's go back and, and see what's going on in Australia. Um, but, you know, with the proviso that we, we could always, if we, we did two months or three months and we didn't like it, then we've always got London or we got somewhere else or whatever, where would we want to go sort of thing. But coming back, um, yeah, it was, it was a big adjustment for me. It was, it was huge. Uh, it took me, took me a long time to probably actually settle back here properly. Um, and that wasn't really, I think that was just me personally. I don't think it was to do with my surroundings. I don't think it was to do with, with anything. It was just, you're in one environment for so long, um, that, then coming back and and look you know, straight is a different culinary scene than than London you know or especially you know looking at Melbourne it, and you know, I'm not going to compare the two but it is it is an adjustment and when you have been away for so long I didn't really have those connections I didn't really have the guy I'd worked with you know last year or the year before or five years ago to kind of use as sounding boards so in many ways it was it was starting fresh again it was just literally. At, at the age of 30 starting, it felt a little bit like starting my career again. Um, but I was fortunate to, you know, I landed, landed the role at Leventine Hill out in the Yarra Valley, um, which again was, was a great learning curve for me to kind of look at. It, it really opened my eyes to, okay, there's more to your little small, a small business and, or, a, or a fine dining kitchen with, eight people going hell for leather to produce one menu. There's actually more to it um, in this industry. So that was that was probably the first first thing that opened my eyes slightly to to that. These days you're at uh, Society and uh, Lillian's as well. Tell us a bit about your food. Is there, are there some dishes from either venue you can tell us a bit about that sort of speak of where your cooking's at? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, looking at, at Society and Lillian, I mean, so we really – and, and particularly with the food, it's uh, it's trying not to to kind of sink into being being a particular type of cuisine. Um, and I think that's really reflective of my cooking and my team's cooking around me. Is you know we're not going to we, we're influenced from from basically everywhere. Um, and I think that's I like to believe that's the way cooking should be going. Unless you've got something to say because that's important and culturally significant to you, then we've got to be open to using you know, what's around us and, and the information's there. So, you know, looking at, at the dishes, there's a, you know, particularly there's a new 
new scallop dish that we just put on in, in Lillian's, which, you know, represents my style of cooking, um, probably if we're, we're going to delve into that. Um, that is, you know, horseradish, green peas and scallops. And, and that's kind of a lot of it comes from my experience. It is, is probably a European dish if we're to, to label it anything. But I think that kind of really represents what we're trying to do. It's elegant. It's using the best ingredients um, and it's delivered. It's not overly complex. I'm not an overly technical cook. Um, I do enjoy, obviously, technique, but I also don't – I don't, I don't feel necessary to have 10, 15, 20 different techniques or gels or whatever it may be in a dish if it, if it doesn't need it. Some do, which is great. Um, but, you know, it's also I – th- I feel you need to be able to adapt to the diners at the time. I think that's one thing I've tried to mature with and tried to learn with, with food uh, and with, you know, whether it be – society, Lillian, events, um, my own perspective, whatever it may be, but it's you've got to be able to listen to the people and what they're looking for and what they want out of your dining room. So I mean, we're fortunate. I'm in a very fortunate position to have the scale of the upper, more sophisticated dining with the, dining with the society room and then you know, Lillian being a much more uh, day-to-day brasserie approach where it kind of allows – for that spectrum, if you know, if we've got a great idea for delicious pink peppercorn bordelaise sauce, there's room for that. Um, but you know, if there's another idea for okay, we're gonna we're gonna find this jewfish in Western Australia and get it sent over here and serve it, uh, serve it 12 hours after it's come out of the water, then we can look at that as well. Um, so it's really, I really enjoy the fact that I have that range uh, in what we what we do. Well, you got a very, very busy job there with um, two huge restaurants uh, and you've built a life back here in Australia. What is it that you love about what you do? I, I really, I guess what I love about what I do is is the consistent growth in what what we're doing now. I think that's that's something that gets me out of bed each day, being able to have an impact on, as I said, 30, 40 chefs and then even more front of house professionals um, being able to kind of take all that stuff that we've spoken about and that I've kind of learned over the years and, and, and being able to put that back in to the industry here. Um, and that's, that's a big part of what society is set up for. It is, it is there to be a restaurant that can be used as a destination for professionals, but also obviously our guests. But I think that that's what gets me out of bed each day is the, you know going in and being like I, I'm I'm constantly challenged but I'm constantly learning myself and and I believe the people around me are being able are they're able to learn as well. Well, Luke, it's uh, amazing to catch up with you and I uh, look forward to seeing uh, what unfolds in the next couple of years in the role. Uh, we loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear your story. Please keep in touch and we'll catch up again soon. Great, thanks, Anthony. Appreciate it. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.